So Claire, it's been quite a journey over the last four years or so. Have you been surprised at the success of Quillette? Uh, yes and no. I mean, we've worked very hard to get where we are today. And so it's kind of the situation where the public sees the tip of the iceberg and the iceberg is all of the, the hard work and the stress and the problem solving that has had to go on behind the scenes. And um, we were not successful for a long time. We were plugging away, doing our thing, publishing um, what we thought were great articles um, for a long time before many people knew who we were. Um, so it, it hasn't been an overnight success, if that makes sense. It's been a work in progress. As you said, it's not been an overnight success. What do you think are the key things that have made Quillette the success that it is? Not just the hard work, I'm, obviously you, you've done amazing work behind the scenes, but what do you think has, is a reflection of the culture that has, that has enabled Quillette to kind of have the resonance that it has? I suppose a few cultural events really came to the fore. Um, one was James Damore's sacking from Google. Um, that was our first real breakthrough article because we asked um, four scientists to comment on his arguments and to comment on their scientific validity. And the four scientists who we spoke to all said that his arguments were quite reasonable and within the bounds of normal scientific discourse. And when we published that, that was the only piece out of all of the mainstream media coverage of the issue which actually looked at the science um, and took a measured approach. And so our popularity increased substantially after that. And then there's been a few other cultural episodes that we've responded to. And, and then there, we've also just benefited from a general network effect where um, we publish dissident academics, so academics whose field of work rubs against the um, more mainstream narratives either within their field or within the general culture. And so once we publish a renegade academic, his or her friends will read that work and they'll think, oh, I want to go and publish with them because they're a friendly space for people with dissenting views. So we've benefit, benefited from that kind of network effect. I can remember the Google memo and there was an article in the Atlantic I think by Connor Friersdorf saying that he couldn't remember how so many journalists has, had mischaracterized a document that was freely available to so many people. Yes and that's just one example and and there are other examples too. For um, Just think of a lot of the mainstream coverage of Jordan Peterson a lot of, there's a lot of extreme rhetoric, you know, he's a misogynist, he's this and that, when all of his content is available to anyone who has an internet connection. So I think what happens is mainstream media present a, a caricature of an individual or an, in, or an event and regular people in their own homes can just connect to the internet, look it up themselves and make their own, form their own views and their own opinion. And the disconnect that they see between the raw materials or the primary source and the interpretation offered by the mainstream media creates this cognitive dissonance. Um, and that, that dissonance is something we've benef benefited from because we view ourselves as being a media um, platform that doesn't engage in these flagrant misrepresentations. And what do you think is the nature of that corruption of the mainstream media? Uh, well, I think there's definitely more than one variable at play, but um, from my observations, um, a lot of journalists live in a bubble in the United States. So they might be located in a couple of urban centers, maybe in New York or San Francisco. They um, have their social circles 
uh, collapsed into their professional circles. Um, they're all on Twitter, so they're immersed in this social professional milieu where they're all trying to impress each other and this feedback loop just becomes very tight and it's hard for reality to sort of pen penetrate that bubble. Quillet has now been called the in-house magazine of the intellectual dark web. What does the intellectual dark web as a concept mean to you? Well it's a broad term but I think it would apply to anyone who's trying to understand the current moment but is simultaneously questioning dominant narratives that are most frequently offered about the current moment. Um, something that Quillette has done from its inception is question blank slate narratives. So blank slate narratives about human nature. So this is the idea that we're born as blank slates, everything we do or every um, sociological outcome is determined by culture. And so we, we've challenged that narrative by looking at things like biology, evolutionary psychology, economic factors, um, other than this cultural deterministic model. Um, so if you look at something like the gender pay gap through the cultural deterministic model, women earn less than men because they're being discriminated against. But if you look at it through a, um, a, a model that takes into account biology, psychology and economics, you'll see that there are a range of different variables and uh, women are often choosing other priorities in life they might have different preferences for the jobs that they undertake. They might uh, priorit prioritize intrinsic motivations over extrinsic motivations such as money. So there are a range of other things going on. Uh, the story is much more complex than simply one of discrimination. So we've, we've tried to challenge this cultural deterministic model that is very dominant within mainstream media. And have you been surprised at all at the way that Quillette has been framed in some circles as kind of outriders for the alt-right and stuff like that? Um, not really. I think the people who frame us in that way generally don't read our articles and um, that kind of simplistic um, framing is just immediately refuted by reading it any of our most popular articles. Our, our articles are sophisticated and nuanced. We don't present um, uh, simple binary arguments of the oppressor versus the oppressed. We're looking at things, we're trying to understand reality how it, as how it is. We're not trying to just present these black and white stories that appeal to preschool children. And how would you describe your personal politics? I consider myself to be a centrist. I think in the United States I'd probably be on the left because I support um, things like the minimum wage, um, universal health care. I support a welfare net. Um, but in Australia I'm probably centre-right because we have a welfare net already and um, a lot of that low hanging fruit has already been picked and um, so it's con context specific. The thing that um, puts me up against the left is I reject identity politics and I don't think identity politics is helpful. Um, I, I'm a critic of feminism, mainstream feminism, I'm a critic of things like critical race theory and um, postmodern discourse and that kind of thing. So that, that's what puts me up against the left. But on a lot of other issues, I'm very sympathetic with the leftist worldview. And what topics for Quillette bring the most kind of heat from critics? I suppose anything that we publish on um, explaining gaps in society uh, with... So anything on race would be one. Any, any topic covering, uh, any article topic covering race would, is a hot button issue. 
Um, but then there are surprising um, topics like parenting is a controversial topic. People have very different views on parenting styles. We published an article on spanking, which was very controversial. Lots of people arguing that spanking is child abuse. Lots of people arguing that, you know, it's uh, reasonable in some situations. So it's, it can be unpredictable what is the most controversial topic. And you mentioned race. Obviously, Coleman Hughes has been sort of one of your star columnists. What do you make of the reaction to his articles? Well, I think his critics um, don't know what to do with him because he's come out of nowhere. He's very young, he's extremely talented, and he presents his arguments in a very reasonable and measured manner. And I think his, his critics so far haven't been able to deconstruct his arguments or dismantle his arguments, and they've um, attacked him on uh, criteria that is irrelevant, such as the fact that he's an undergraduate student or um, that he hasn't cited their favourite scholar in critical race theory. So, um, but, but he's, he's received a lot of um, positive attention as well as criticism, so that's, that's good to see. Because I guess there's a paradox with someone like Coleman because he, he has had a huge amount of success with you can argue that a lot of these perspectives are not getting a lot of uh, play in the mainstream media, but then someone like Coleman Hughes comes along and he's immediately swept up by an alternative network of, of media organisations. And there's a kind of, is there a paradox there that we can say, oh, well, these views are being shut out, but then someone like him has become hugely successful at a very young age for this perspective he's bringing? I don't think these perspectives are necessarily being shut out, but I, from my point of view, I see a lot of low hanging fruit. So there's a lot of perspectives that aren't being explored simply because those who are populating um, a lot of the elite media institutions aren't covering them. So, I mean, for example, there are only so many ways to analyze a sociological phenomenon through the lens of race and gender and if someone comes in and has a different analytical framework then they're just offering something fresh and interesting and the problem that I see is that these elite institutions are populated by people who all think the same and who have been educated at the same schools and there's a, a lack of originality more than anything. Has any of the criticism been personally hurtful? To me? To you? No, I don't think so. Um, no. Would you say you're pretty thick-skinned? Yeah, I view criticism as uh, a positive thing. I would be much more concerned if I wasn't receiving any criticism. And I know that you have quite a lot of your audience based in the US. Yes. As, as do we. I mean, we cover some similar topics on Rebel Wisdom. We've had uh, people like Brett Weinstein, Eric Weinstein, Jordan Peterson on the channel. And so it's very easy. Well, it's interesting because we're both based outside the US, but we're also exposed to the US conversation in quite a, a major way. How do you avoid? I mean, I guess we're both aware of like how toxic the conversation can become in the US, but with a sort of slight distance to it as well. Do you think that distance is really important to what you're doing with Quillette? I think so, and, uh, and the distance allows one to have a meta perspective, so a bigger picture view. I think one of the problems in the US at the moment is that people are focusing on the, the small partisan issues that occur from day to day. There's a lot of noise and it's hard to get the signal, but if you step back and take a bigger picture view and you look at the cultural trends rather than the little events that are happening every day, you can see larger patterns, more important patterns. And so on Quillette, we, I mean, we do sometimes respond to current events, but we try to take a bigger picture view. Um, and I think, I think it's been uh, successful because 
there are a lot of people around the world that that like that approach and they're not interested in just the the um, the partisan squabbles that are happening day in and day out. And how do you cover these kind of topics without getting dragged into sort of the culture war of the US? Well, I think we're, we are a part of the culture war in the US, um, but we're not part of the partisan political war. In terms of partisan politics in the US, we are nonpartisan. Even the intellectual dark web was, was framed as a space for conversation. And it seems that the nature of the conversation in the, in the US is that everything seems to become polarized almost immediately. So even this idea of a, a space beyond the polarization then becomes a polarizing thing in itself. Even the attempt to carve out a space beyond the culture war becomes part of the culture war. I think that's true, but what one has to understand about the United States right now is because they are a very polarized society, there's not a lot of trust. And so it's difficult for people to have conversations in good faith. Um, people are on edge because they feel like what they say might be cherry picked or misinterpreted and people are searching for secret signs that they're a secret supporter of Trump or a secret white nationalist and so it inhibits people a great deal. I think the benefit of being an outsider is that we have less inhibition and from my point of view being an Australian I still live in a society that is not so polarized. It's a high trust society so I know that when I go and talk to friends they're not trying to uh, find me out as a secret supporter of such and such cause. I can say what I genuinely think without being afraid and I think if we bring bringing that in lack of inhibition and that um, that earnestness to conversation is beneficial and even though people will try to um, smear the IDW as um, you know right wing or whatever that doesn't mean we can't have these good faith, faith discussions within it. You were in America for, I think you, you appeared on the Dave Rubin show and a couple of other media, media appearances quite recently. What really struck you about the American conversation while you were there or the American culture while you were there? People get really emotional talking about politics. If any pol political um, topic enters the conversation, you can feel people's blood pressure rising. People get really emotional, like either, it doesn't matter which political persuasion they are part of, um, but I notice that it, it, there's, there's such a heightened level of feeling. Um, and I feel, I feel sorry for my American friends because I think it's really difficult to have meaningful conversations in those conditions. Yeah, I think my, my perspective, I, I guess there's a similarity with, between the UK and, and Australia and some differences, but there does seem to be, perhaps because we've had the BBC for many years as a kind of respected voice in the conversation, our media environment is very different from the US. It just feels like there's a, there is more of a sense of a civil space beyond the polarization in the UK and maybe in Australia as well. Whereas in the US, there doesn't, there don't seem to be any spaces for people to meet that are not polar, that are not immediately seen as being on one side or the other. There's, there's almost no middle ground left. I think that's true. And I think it's very unfortunate. And in Australia, we have the ABC, which is sometimes considered to be extremely left-wing, but it really isn't. It's really quite a balanced organization and um, they do a pretty good job of presenting diverse views and, and so things are a lot calmer and more relaxed here. And 
and we're very lucky to have so far escaped the polarization that has that is afflicting the United States. And something I've been very conscious of since starting Rebel Wisdom, especially on YouTube, where YouTube is is a very different culture to probably many other places on the internet. There's definitely a much more, um, I'd say a more right-wing bias probably on YouTube generally. Yeah. And is, is the, the, the phenomenon of audience capture. There's this kind of idea out there that if you're, if you're self-reliant, if you're funding yourself through Patreon or through some other kind of crowdfunding site, then you're immune from the, the biases of the mainstream media, but my experience is that it can bring in another form of bias because you learn what your audience wants. And a lot of the time, especially on YouTube, what they want is stuff that is attacking the left or is, is, is anti the mainstream media because they feel that, that, that so many perspectives are not being represented in the mainstream media. Yeah. How, do you feel that sense of or do you, do you feel the danger of audience capture in what you're doing? And if so, what do you do about it? That's an important point. I think one thing that we've done at Quillette is focus on our guiding principles. So we, we have a very clear mission to preserve free thought. So whatever kind of authoritarian um, influence is imposing itself on free thought, we will try and defend free thinkers and free thought from that. So if there's an authoritarian, um, uh, if there's authoritarian ideology in universities, for example, we will push back against that. However, if there's some kind of um, authoritarian uh, movement coming from the right, then we will push back against that. So we've orient, oriented ourselves around protecting um, something quite specific and easily definable, and that is free thought, free thinkers, people wanting to explore empirical questions without having their lives destroyed, um, people coming up with original ideas. And so that gives us the freedom and the responsibility to be relatively um, independent and we do, I mean, we are aware of what our audience likes, but we also have to not bore our audience. So our audience will become bored if we present the same arguments over and over again. Mm -hmm. So we need diversity, we need a variety, and we seek that out as much as we can. I mean, one of the big questions in this space is where the boundaries are and how, where the gatekeeping comes in. I think Barry Weiss wrote the article for the New York Times and that was her conclusion was, okay, it's, it's, it's a great or it's a positive thing to have a space for heterodox opinions of the intellectual dark web, but how do you, where are the boundaries? Where and how do you draw those boundaries? Yeah, so on Quillette we draw a boundary around ideas. So we, um, we generally have the view that empirical question, all empirical questions or scientific questions are legitimate. Uh, however, we don't publish uh, arguments that are not well formed. We don't publish overly emotional, um, histrionic uh, diatribes that are uh, you know, written by people who are angry or upset or just bitter. So we try and filter out a lot of the, um, uh, the, the, the pieces written when people are in a hot emotional state and we look for the, the arguments that are constructed from, peop from people having a cool level-headed point of view. Um, that being said, it's, difficult, it's a difficult space to negotiate and we also have to have very strong spines. I mean, people will attack us if we um, publish heterodox opinions and arguments about race, for example, or gender. And we have to, we have to have strong spines and just say, look, we are a space for free thought. Uh, that's our mission. And we're going to defend free thought. Um, 
that being said, we're not uh, a free for all. People can't just uh, write something because they're upset or angry and send it in. And we're not going to publish it. We we uh, meticulously curate the articles that we publish. And one of the criticisms I've seen, because that there, there I have seen quite a few articles more and more, and I think you alluded to this earlier in the interview when you said that when one academic is published, often other academics will see that and then will approach you. But there has become, there are quite a lot of articles more recently about people who've fallen foul of, um, who, who've, who've been excluded because they wouldn't go along with a certain group thing. Yeah. Is there a danger, and I've seen that framed as that Quillette is just publishing victim stories of of people is, is there a danger of being stereotyped as publishing many articles around the same topic like that well these articles that we've published have been quite serious um, cases where people have had their lives disrupted or in some cases destroyed by social justice mobs and we're not publishing articles about someone experiencing a microaggression in their university classroom and their day was ruined. We're publishing articles written in the first person by people who have lost their jobs, who have been attacked and hounded online and harassed. And um, we do not feel uh, the need to apologize for that and I would turn it around and ask progressives why this, these particular cases of injustice aren't worthy of um, uh, public consumption. Well, we think they are, and um, I, they're, they're, the, the stories that we've published are um, important stories to tell. And do you have a sense, I mean, the big question, I guess, at the moment especially with America and the sort of sense of increasing polarization is whether the center can hold. Do you have a sense of whether the center can hold? That's an open question. Um, we'll see what happens in the 2020, uh, the lead up to the 2020 elections. I, my view is that probably not um, in the short term. I think I don't see how the current um, polarization, I don't see any signs that it's de-escalating. And I don't think it's just, I don't think it's just um, Trump or just the Democrats. I think there's a lot going on involving technology and social media that we don't currently understand. And we're all too close to it at the moment to really, to really know what's going on. And, and the future is, is very unpredictable at this point. Are you, are you worried about it? Yeah, I am. And I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing with Quillette if I weren't worried about it. From my perspective, I, I see the, the re-establishing of a place where genuine dialogue can take place as an existential question for our culture at the moment. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, I, I'm aware that there are thousands of people all over the world who feel like they can't have open, meaningful conversations on lots of important topics. And I'm trying to create a haven where the, these kinds of discussions can occur and um, I do believe, although I am pessimistic about the trajectory of polarization, particularly in the United States, I am also, I do have a lot of faith in the human capacity to solve problems. And um, we've certainly faced larger problems as the species before and have solved them successfully. So on the one hand, I'm pessimistic. On the other hand, I'm optimistic that we can solve these problems together. Why do you think the, the conversation is so much more toxic in America compared to elsewhere in the world? 
Well, I mean, it's, it's really hard to pinpoint one particular causal variable and there are a range of different variables impacting the situation. Um, and I think it's a very long term, um, it's a, it, what's built, it's, it's built up over a very long period, but I can see that uh, they have a lower level of social trust than other nations and um, the, the clustering of um, educated professional white collar people into these urban centres such as New York, San Francisco and other cities has meant that there are generations of middle class people who have lost all contact with people who live in rural areas or people who work in working, working class blue collar professions. And I see um, a lot of upper middle class, uh, sort of what you would call elites um, in the urban centres, just having very um, caricatured views of people living in rural areas. Um, and I don't think that's something we have so much in Australia. We don't have this bubble effect where everybody goes off and lives in urban environments. I mean, we do have, that is happening more and more, but I think it's happened to a much greater degree in the United States. Um, the best book I've read on this topic is Coming Apart by Charles Murray. And he charts this process as having occurred, you know, from as early as the 1960s, where people have just Cl clustered into these like-minded communities and they've lost contact with each other and they've lost understanding of each other. And what's next for Quillette? Are you, are you interested? I mean, one thing we're trying to do is to take the discussions that we're having on the, the channel and try and take them out into the real world and, and create events for people to discuss these topics. Is that something, how, how do you take the kind of conversations you're having and, and take them out into the world? Well, we had our first Quillette social event in Toronto in January, and that was a very fun event and very successful for everybody who came. And we'd love to do more events like that in cities around the world. Um, but we're so busy right now trying to run the business and scale up that it's just a matter of finding the time. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, it will be really beneficial for everybody if we can bring these online networks into the face-to-face -face real world and help people establish authentic, meaningful connections with one another. Because another thing that we're dealing with at the moment is loneliness. A lot of people are quite lonely and they feel left out of communities that they're involved in either at work or in their social life and um, bringing like-minded people together can, is really, can be really beneficial on the individual level, particularly for people who, who are lonely. And I would love to be able to bring that to cities all around the world um, and that's definitely something that we will hope to do with Quillette into the future.